lesson number nine, and we are in Galatians 4 at verse 21, and I want to go all the way into the first verse of chapter 5, and it's that first verse of chapter 5 that I want to read at the very start of our lesson. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Freedom. Uh, September 1620, uh, the Mayflower, uh, there was also the Speedwell, and it uh, had to come back because it was taking in uh, water. Uh, but uh, the Mayflower uh, set course from Holland, uh, heading westwards across the Atlantic 66 days uh, later, November the 9th in 1620, uh, it was spotted off Cape Cod. 102 passengers of saints and strangers, 30 crew within months, uh, winter, um, and 45 of them uh, died. Uh, the saints, of course, came for freedom uh, to escape uh, King James uh, in uh, England and the acts of intolerance uh, for uh, Puritan worship. Freedom. It's a birth of a nation story. And uh, that's what Paul is now going to do here, tell you the birth of a nation story. And it's about two women and one man and two sons, the birth uh, of Jews and Arabs, uh, Isaac and Ishmael, Sarah and Hagar, and of course, Abraham. And the issue, uh, verse 21, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? And so he's going to tell us the history, and then Paul, in verses 24 through 27, is going to do something just a little bit weird, a little bit unusual. Paul is usually a logical thinker. Scholars say he was influenced in his rhetorical, analytical style by Quintilian uh, of, of Greece, and uh, more often than not, Paul uh, argues and reasons logically now he turns to an entirely different way of teaching, and he introduces what we call an allegory, uh, like uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's uh, pro Progress, except the characters in this allegory are actual, real um, people. So he begins uh, it, with history, and he's back again with Abraham, and we've seen Abraham pop up several times because what he wants to say is that Jews and Gentiles, without obedience to the ceremonial law of the Old Testament, are equally children of Abraham. The point is that Abraham had more than one child. He had Ishmael, and that is a problem. And you remember in Genesis 16, Sarah um, told Abraham to sleep with Hagar, um, the slave girl uh, to all intents and, and, and purposes, and uh, Sarah is barren, and, um, and he, Abraham does that. And then in Genesis 18, you remember God comes to Abraham who's a mm, hundred, and Sarah who is... 90, and, and says, you're going to have a son. And do you remember uh, Sarah, she, she laughs, and she's rebuked for laughing, but you can understand why she laughed. She's way past the age of childbearing. And uh, Isaac is born. And uh, the point here in verse 23, the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. And he's setting up now uh, an allegory. Uh, one is of the flesh, and one is of faith. 
Uh, and it's a perfect allegory for what Paul has been talking about in terms of um, our justification. Uh, one view, the Judaizers' view, it's of the flesh. It's through obedience. It's through the imposition of laws upon the consciences of Christians that have no place uh, within the kingdom of God. And obedience to them out of conscience sake would be legalism. And the other is by faith um, alone. And uh, the point, Ishmael was a slave and Isaac was free. And uh, that's the history. It's a history of the birth of a, uh, a nation story. And there's the way of the flesh and there's the way of faith. There's the way of works and there's uh, the way that is uh, reflective of how we are made right in the sight of God, not through human effort, not through human obedience, but entirely as a free gift from Almighty God and received by faith alone. Well, the allegory then is one of, one is by works and the other is by faith. Two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, two mothers, Hagar, uh, which represents Mount Sinai, which is in Arabia, so representing law, and the other, Sarah, representing Jerusalem, the mother of all who believe. And you have to go with the allegory from Hagar to Sinai, and you remember Sinai, uh, when Moses describes Sinai, it's uh, clouds cover it, and there's thunder and, and lightning, and it's an oppressive uh, place, uh, and the description of it is one of oppression. There are two covenants, two, two sons, two mothers, two covenants, and one is by works, and one is by grace. Verse 24, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. And the other is Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Verse 26, there's the way of works, do this and live, and there's the way of grace, live and do this. The way of works, do this and you will live. Perform and you will live. Work and you will live. And there's the way of grace, live and do this out of obedience. Not in order to become a Christian, but because you are one and you're the child of a king. With Jesus, our Savior, you're the child of a king. Now, what's the point of this? Why has Paul introduced here this uh, allegory? And he doesn't do this uh, often. This is unusual. And this is not uh, meant to justify using all of the Old Testament allegorically. And uh, in the history of the church, and one thinks of Origen, for example, uh, there was an influence that lasted all the way through the Middle Ages that uh, all um, historical narrative in the Old Testament uh, should be interpreted allegorically. And seeing things uh, then in historical narrative that are not meant to be seen. And I think the rule of thumb is we should only interpret the Old Testament allegorically where the Bible itself does. And, and, and don't go any further. Don't, don't start doing your own little bit of allegorization of the Old Testament, because it'll probably get you into, into muddy, murky uh, waters. Now, the lesson is a, a wonderful lesson, and it's um, grace to the barren and the desolate. Uh, the point of the allegory is that Sarah, at least from one perspective, and we need to say this delicately, um, it's not that simply she was barren, couldn't have children, and that's a, that's a very difficult position for a young woman to be in. And uh, one needs a great deal of sensitivity 
for example, around uh, Mother's Day, but there are folk in the congregation who can't have children, or they're living with the guilt uh, of having aborted a child, or uh, they're living with uh, the problems that their children uh, no longer want to have anything to do with them, and a multitude of other scenarios. So, so, so the condition is one of enormous sensitivity. But in this instance, Sarah is 90 years old. She's, she's in her 10th decade of life, and uh, there's, there, there is no way uh, that a 90-year-old can have a child. Um, and if she does, it's a miracle. If she does, it's the imposition of the sovereign hand of God. It's a God thing. It's, it's not a man thing. It's not a human thing. It's a God thing. And that's a perfect way to describe salvation. Salvation is not by human effort. It's not by human initiative. It's not by human intuition. It's not by human cleverness. It's entirely a God thing. Unless a man is born from above, we could translate born again as from above, meaning not, not so much emphasizing the second birth, but emphasizing the sovereignty of that birth. That our new birth is entirely because of the imposition and the intervention of the sovereignty of God. From one point of view, um, Sarah was a failure. She was broken. She was a clay pot, fragile. It must have been intolerable for her in uh, it's hard to imagine being married to two women at the same time or having two women in the same house. But, but um, the taunting and so on, and uh, one thinks of, uh, of uh, Samuel's mother, um, Hannah, and, uh, and uh, uh, how she was taunted by another woman in the house who was as fertile as a rabbit, it seems, and uh, the difficulty uh, of that. And um, I think the point in the allegory is that the gospel is for failures. The gospel is for the broken. The gospel is for those who cannot save themselves. The gospel is for those who cannot do anything. There's no amount of input on our part that can bring about this desired um, result. I sometimes think uh, in our celebration of the Lord's table, it is customary to read from 1 Corinthians 11 and the dire warning about uh, eating and drinking judgment to yourselves. And um, uh, sometimes we, we pick up that word uh, to, to, to eat and to drink unworthily, unworthily. And that, therefore, there's something that we need to do to make ourselves worthy. Sometimes uh, preachers will read that passage. And to be fair, Paul is addressing a situation in Corinth that is unlike any situation that I've ever encountered in 40 years of ministry. Uh, what was going on in Corinth was, was systemic failure. What was going on in Corinth was, was unbelievably wicked. Uh, there were things going on in the Lord's Supper and in the agape love feast uh, combined with uh, perhaps a church potluck dinner. And, and the whole thing is garbled in 1 Corinthians 11. And um, it's, it's chronic. And, and perhaps, perhaps that's not the passage that we should use for communion on a day-to-day, week-to-week, year-to-year basis, because that's not where most of our congregations are. The problem is it's the only passage in the New Testament that mentions the Lord's Supper. But sometimes that passage can be used in such a way to bring a sense of fear and, and a sense of gloom and, and a sense of trepidation. And, 
And I don't think that's how the Lord's Supper should be thought of. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a celebration. It's an anticipation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we ought to eat and drink with joy and with assurance and with a sense of the blessedness uh, of our condition as children within uh, the family coming to the family table for a meal. Actually, the Lord's Supper is more like an hors d'oeuvre uh, in anticipation of uh, the meal, reminding us that we are pilgrims and we're on a journey, and now are we the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. I mention the Lord's Supper because there's a very famous uh, story uh, from the 19th century. Uh, Rabbi Duncan, the great Hebraist and, and, and scholar of uh, many languages, indeed, uh, from the F Free Church of Scotland in the 19th century, and uh, he was uh, taking communion and noticed uh, a woman uh, in tears and and her Bible open and drops of tears falling down on her Bible. And, and when the bread, the plate came in her direction, uh, she just shook her head. And Rabbi Duncan, who knew this woman very well, said to her, Take it, woman. It's for sinners. And, and that's the point of the Lord's Supper, that there's nothing that we can do to make ourselves worthy of this bread and worthy of this cup. We are unworthy by nature. And Jesus died not because we are worthy, but because we are unworthy. And uh, there's a sense uh, here in Galatia that in order uh, to be assured of their status, they, they need to make themselves worthy. And the way they did that was to obey out of conscience uh, laws, ceremonial laws from the Old Testament, days and weeks and months and, and so on, and, and perhaps also in the background the issue of circumcision for Gentiles and, and the issue of, uh, of food laws, kosher food laws, and imposing this upon the consciences of the uh, Gentiles. And then this first verse of chapter 5, for freedom Christ has set us free. Um, whatever you think of Nelson Mandela uh, is beside the point, but uh, he was imprisoned, of course, in South Africa. And uh, uh, when he was released from prison, uh, and I've, I've been to the prison, I've seen where it is on that little island off the coast of uh, Cape Town. And uh, you remember the book he wrote, Cry Freedom. And, and that's really what Paul is saying here. Freedom, don't, don't give that up. Liberty. Liberty and justice for all. Don't give up that liberty. Um, you know, that's very special to me as a recent American citizen. Um, truth be told, Her Majesty never gives up her subject, so I still actually have my British passport. But, but uh, um, Thanksgiving Day has taken on a whole new meaning. Um, liberty. Uh, liberty uh, in the Mayflower sense, liberty for those saints. There were also strangers on board, but there were saints on board the Mayflower, and uh, they came to escape from bondage. Now, now, what is legalism? Legalism is obeying out of conscience laws which God does not demand. Obeying out of conscience Meaning that if you don't obey these laws, your conscience is going to condemn you. Do this, do that. Taste not, touch not, handle not. And uh, you, can, you can bring out the examples of uh, legalism in the church. Jesus has died to give you freedom. Jesus has died to give you freedom from imposing laws which have no business being imposed upon your conscience. And that, and that liberty, you know, it's the issue of uh, meat being offered to idols that Paul takes up elsewhere in Corinth and elsewhere in the Epistle to the Romans and so on, 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14. You know, and Abe is coming home from work and he's passing uh, the butchers 
and uh, it's late at night and there's no refrigeration and there are flies everywhere and uh, the meat is being offered uh, at 25% uh, of what it's worth. And he, and he says, um, uh, give me the meat. And he pays for it and he goes home and he says to his wife, uh, it's going to be uh, stew for supper tonight. And, uh, and she says, did you get it from that butcher's? And he said, yeah, of course I got it from the butcher's. And then she says, was it offered to idols? Ask no questions for conscience sake. Meat is meat. But now that you've asked questions for conscience sake, you're in a mess of trouble. Because that's what legalism does. It binds you. It messes you up. It makes you look at yourself, and it makes you look at laws, and it makes you look at obedience rather than look at Jesus who has given you freedom, freedom to be whom God intends you to be. Well, celebrate that freedom and hold on to that freedom. Don't let law meddlers mess up your conscience. My conscience is captive to the Word of God and to the Word of God alone. It was the heart of uh, Luther. Uh, so help me God uh, that our consciences are held captive only to Jesus and to no one else. You notice in verse 29, Paul says, Just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So it is now. And that's the heart of legalism. It's a form of persecution. It's a form of manipulation. It's a form of control. When churches, institutions, preachers, whoever they are, try to mess up your conscience, try to impose something that the Bible has never imposed, it's a form of persecution. It's a form of control, and you must not let it happen. Cry freedom. For freedom, Christ has set me free. Well, we'll have more to see about freedom in our next lesson.